Hey, I actually action. Got, I actually got it done that time. I didn't cool. have to look. <laughs> so is everybody on there? <sighs> We've started. Are we on? Cool. Are we live? All right. Hey we guys, rocking? welcome back to Buckle Up with Mike and Brian. Today's hey, guess who he is? Not Mike. <laughs> today's segment is on the refrigeration circuit. So oh, leave your questions in the chat and these two fellows will answer them for you on that topic. Before we get started, our next buckle up is September 30th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. As you guys know, we go live every other Thursday at 4 p.m. California time. Um, so be sure to mark it in your calendar so you don't miss these guys. All right, ready to kick it off? How the heck can you miss these guys? <laughs> There's a lot of people that try. <laughs> All right, you guys, you've heard this before. I'm going to tell you again. Pepsi, let me down, man. I have not, nobody's, nobody's hooked me up. You see what this is? That's clear, bubbling, just carbonated water. Not even any color in it. Ugh. That's pretty sad. Pepsi Co. needs to step it up. Yep. For the buckle mm -hmm. up. Yep. <laughs> I mean, after all, Brian even made me get rid of the Sprite because it was a Coca-Cola product. So, hey, doing you know, my part. I, I know, represent. I know. Man. I can't believe they didn't take care of you. You guys are getting a lot of hearts. <laughs> a lot of love coming in. So, Mr. Mikey, good to have you back. Good to be back, brother. Um, Brian's been concentrating on a whole lot of things. One of the things that Brian's been concentrating on what is on Mike's mind. <laughs> and as you can see, there's a, a, scary lot on, there's a lot on Mike's mind. I'm not sure but, I have a mind. But one of the things that he's picked up on the various uh, uh, tech support calls mm -hmm. is um, refrigeration circuit questions. And a lot of it has been pointed to the metering devices, cap tubes, flow raters, expansion valves, um, and, and I know you're going to hit on this subject, um, hence the whiteboard, mm -hmm. but the EER rating or SEER ratings of the machines are going crazy yep. um, with, with today's technologies and, and being able to put, I never thought I'd see the day where you had EXVs in a residential unit and EV, EXV boards and, and all that stuff. But all that base, what that all is about is getting the SEER ratings up yep. and, and consuming less energy, less global warming, less, less uh, carbon footprint. Did you ever think you'd ever see variable speed compressors in residential? I did not, nor it's variable speed uh, ECM motors. Mm -hmm. that, exactly. Know, like, but so. then again, I'm not old. Um, <laughs> At least not compared to me. <laughs> so, but that being said, a lot of the common things that Mike has, has, has gotten questions on is, is guys that are walking up to these high sear units and they're mix matched. So um, I know you're gonna, I can say, I know you're gonna yep. explain this further, but uh, you guys got questions on this stuff. That's what we're here for. You can always text us. You can hit us up on our forum. Uh, the yep. forum has a place in there where you can ask questions. You can look uh, look up previous questions. If you've got a question on a specific machine, you've got uh, a topic that you want to look up, you can do a search for topics, or you can just jump on the forum and ask a new question. Or you can turn around and actually answer questions. So if you've got experience on something yep. that you see a question on, Jump in and answer it. I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that have got a lot of experience, but we would really love to take advantage of them sharing and helping to share some of those experiences and yeah, stuff. That's so really what we're here for is to help everybody. So the one the one disclaimer, we are not gonna tolerate any picking on the youngsters or criticizing or putting down. That's not what Blue On is about, that's not what this forum is about. This is about helping each other. It's about being positive. I mean, I get young guys call me and they said, you know, I don't know if I should be calling. I've been only been in the trade for a week. My response is, welcome to the trade and I hope you can have as much fun as I've had over the last 48 years. So it's about helping guys. Let's keep it positive. 
you know, there's even a place on there for memes and, and some funny stuff. And, you know, we're all, we're all good with all that. But, you know, in all seriousness, this is about helping the next generation to be better, to improve their skill sets. Yeah. Because people took the time to help me. I had three or four guys that were the big, you know, key in my life coming up in the trade. And I want to return that to the young guys. I know you feel the same way. Yeah, it's yeah. nice to have it's nice to have somebody under your wing or got your back. I mean, I know that's yeah. our that's our blue ones got your back is our uh, our tag. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. You know, and Mike's going to show you uh, when we get into this. And of course, we want questions from you guys. But again, on the on the high sear equipment, if if you have if you have a, what's the highest? I've only seen 16. What's that? Are they in the 20s yet? They've got 22 and 24s. <laughs> if you've got, if you've got a 16 or above sear machine, and you walk in and look at the evaporator, and it's got a cap tube, or it's got a fixed uh, orifice, uh, AccuFlow or a piston, guys, that's not a 16 sear sear no. machine. <laughs> that is not. <laughs> so you. That's when I when I say mix match. That's what I'm talking about. Putting a 16 sear condensing unit on a 10 sear <laughs> evaporator <laughs> does not equate to a 14 sear machine. <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay. So my math, my math, math hasn't been my strong point. So anyway, <laughs> just kidding. All right. So we ready to dive into this? Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> What prompted a lot of this is I got a phone call from a young technician, and I've gotten a few of them, and he says, I've got this 18 sear machine, and I decided to put a piston in it instead of a TXV. So the problem is, is that, you know, they, they did cap tubes, they did pistons, they did all that kind of stuff, and what was the biggest reason they did it? Because they were cheap. And so as long as they were cheap and there was no driving force to get the energy efficiency up, this industry does not move unless prompted to do so. Right. So, you know, what they've done, <clears throat> you got a couple things you can do to make equipment more efficient. You can put more coils in it, that costs a lot of money, or you can go to an active metering device. And I'm gonna use the term active and passive metering devices. Your cap tubes, your pistons, um, your flow raters, AccuTrolls, a few other things. That's a passive device. There's no controlling element to that. Whereas a thermostatic expansion valve is reacting to things, it's an active device. So, so cap tubes, AccuFlow, ac uh, uh, pistons, passive, meaning it's a fixed size diameter hole. Mm -hmm that does not adjust to what's going on with the system. It's not looking at return air. It's not looking at the suction pressure. Right. It's not even, it doesn't even care about the liquid temperature pressure. None of that has well, an effect does. on a piston. It does. Cap to. On piston too. Piston? Yeah. <clears throat> and here's another thing. Do you explain? Mike? I will explain. But here's, <laughs> here's the other thing. What's the difference between a piston and an orifice? Please do say. Okay. Mike. Pistons are used in heat pumps. Orifices are used in straight cooling. See? All right. That's why we keep him around. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start off with this. And this right here is just about as basic as we get. I got this and I got the belt. There we go. <laughs> so I'll watch the bad words. So we come out of the compressor, we go through the condenser. In the condenser, as I was talking to one of our, our new people, it's really kind of cool. Air conditioning guys aren't that sharp, so they make the words real simple for us. So the condenser is where the refrigerant condenses. All it right. does. It does. It's amazing that items do what they're named, okay? <laughs> Condensers condense, evaporators evaporate, refrigerators refrigerate. And compressors do toast. what? <laughs> they pump. They compress. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we leave the compressor here and we go into the condenser. Now, in most cases, you're going to have a fan blowing air across there, and that's going to help condense the refrigerant. And we're going to come up to the cap tube, and we're going to have a decent column of liquid there 
that is not saturated, it's subcooled, and all the cap tube is is a device to control the flow of refrigerant going into the evaporator. All right. As it come out of the, the cap tube, we're going to have our adiabatic expansion take place where we get that flashing off and we're going to go in with a majority liquid and as we go through the evaporator, we are going to absorb all that heat. Well, the things that changes the flow through a cap tube is if this gets really cold, the pressure is going to drop. If it gets really, really hot out here and the, the pressure goes up, you're going to have a higher differential pressure and it's going to cause more flow. Cap tube systems are critically charged. So we've only got so much refrigerant in this system and when we get maxed out, we don't got no more. It's all <laughs> pretty much done. <clears throat> cap tubes, pistons, orifices, act controls, flow raters, and theoretically a, non a, a, manual, a manual TXV, <laughs> yeah. a manual expansion valve, are all your passive devices, all right? So not a lot going on. We could end up with a coil that's starving for refrigerant under the right conditions, or we could end up with a system that's overfeeding under some conditions. So we're not going to be consistent on our energy usage. Our coil is going to be operating differently all throughout different conditions and everything. So what they did is they started off with these automatic expansion valves, which were kind of a disaster. But Bef before, before, we get into, before we get into that, you hit a key point as it's going through you really have no control over that and and so that's why we use the target superheat yes. calculator because it will take the outdoor conditions the indoor indoor conditions yep. at that time to tell you what your superheat at the compressor should be yep. on the suction line and i'm glad you brought that up because many years ago when i would talk to people when i because i came from a world where cap tubes were non-existent you don't use them on 2,000 ton systems. They just, they're not there. So anyway, so everything with me was expansion valves. And so when I come back, I said, so what target superheat do you go for? And everybody says, well, 12. And I'm like, oh wow, okay. And I started looking at it, I'm like, no, that ain't right. Your superheats can go anywhere between about five and 50 degrees of superheat yep. on a small system. Depending upon those yep. two points. Now, most manufacturers were really, really nice. They put this really nice sticker on the side of the unit. Well, that was great. There was only one little problem. There's this thing called rain and sun and smog and air pollution and, and everything and else and the guy throwing <laughs> the panel across the ground. So you get out there and there's nothing there. <clears throat> right. And basically all you're doing is you're taking a return air wet bulb and an outdoor dry bulb and you're bringing the two things across and it gives you a target superheat. Well, that's great if you've got all the data still there. The problem is most of the time it's gone. So, Blue On, gotta love those guys. Gotta love those engineers and the people that do the app and everything else. Oh, gotta love tech support. <clears throat> gotta love them. They turn around and they created a target superheat. And so what you do is you take the return air wet bulb and the outdoor air dry bulb and you plug that in and it'll give you a target superheat. Now we've run into some people that don't have ways of measuring return air wet bulb. And there's one, go ahead. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're in trouble if you don't have shoelaces. That's right. <laughs> but look, I got shoelaces. You don't have shoelaces, I got shoelaces. I don't need shoelaces. You're lucky I put sandals on. <laughs> so, so anyway, so what, what Jed, mechanical engineer did, really, really cool. He's got outdoor dry bulb, He's got return air, and it's supposed to be dry bulb. It says wet bulb, but it's return air, dry bulb, and then kind of pick. So if you're down south, grab 60% relative humidity. If you're somewhere around Texas or somewhere like that, you know, go ahead and grab like maybe 40. If you're in Arizona, you're screwed. You've got no humidity. So but the point. nice part about the app uh -huh. and our target superheat calculator yep. is you can do it both ways. You can do it both ways. They have the return air wet bulb. Yep and the outside air dry bulb and there's also the guesstimate of right here's my indoor dry bulb my outdoor dry bulb and my relative humidity is about if you got a phone you can look it up and it'll tell you where you're at and yeah what the relative humidity is at that time where you're standing but the one with the return air wet bulb is going to be more accurate 
but the other one gives you a way to get in the ballpark because if you got nothing else, at least it's going to get you there and you can do. And two, the other thing that, that they built into it is when you open up that calculator, mm -hmm. the, the, it has your safety built into it. You're going to see numbers for your target already. Mm -hmm. So if you don't fill anything out, uh, it's going to have a five as the minimum right. super heat. We don't want you guys to blow up compressors, so. Yes, because we're not compressor manufacturers, so we don't make anything when they blow no, up. Oh yeah, no, but so. it's, just a, it's just a safety <laughs> built in. It's a safety built in that even if you do put your numbers in and your numbers are off the bench, of benchmark, you know, Mike was talking about the, the crossing left to right, your X's and Y's. Uh, if you're off that chart, then you will look and you'll see that that five didn't change and that's because you're off the chart if you put your numbers in and it still shows what you saw when you opened up the app it's only just the safety factor mm -hmm. yep so <clears throat> this gives you a way to do things but like you can see you know we have a basically a weight in charge it's a critical charge so when we have no more refrigerant in there that's all the system can do yep all right so what happens, and here's the difference, is if you go to an active metering device, all right, we still have the compressor, we still have the condenser. A lot of times they'll put a sight glass, okay? That sight glass tells us if we have a good column of liquid, a nice subcooled liquid going to that valve. Because we don't want to put a saturated refrigerant through there where we're only 75% liquid and 25% vapor because now we're not gonna get the cooling. So this will tell us that we've got a full column of liquid. An even better way to do it would be to measure your subcooling there and, and figure out where your subcooling's at. Typically, if you don't have a receiver, you know, anything around 10 degrees of subtooling is great, all right? Now, this thermostatic expansion valve has got a sensing element down here reading the suction coming off the evaporator. And what it does is it wants to give, typically you set these up for about 12 degrees. So what happens is, if I'm not open in the valve far enough, this valve is gonna see that, it's gonna exert a pressure on the TXV, and it's gonna open the valve, so it's always adjusting based upon conditions, all right? So if my air temperature changes, if my air volume changes, I'm gonna get changes taking place here in the evaporator and the valve is gonna to respond to that, all right? I mean, theoretically, in a perfect world, we would boil off all the refrigerant right before it went into the compressor so that we were getting the most work out of our coil and everything else. The problem with that is, is because valves are kind of sloppy and they can only turn down so far. If we go too far, then under the right conditions, we could cause flood back and do damage to the compressor. So I think you can see here, if I'm controlling my refrigerant in this coil, I don't care what the outdoor temperatures are, I don't care about any of that other kind of stuff. This is simply looking at what's going on in the coil and it's responding accordingly. So by, by using this, we're a lot more efficient and so we're not turning around running the system and only feeding part of the coil. So, I think you can see why having an active device that's responding to the system is going to be more efficient than a cap, cap tube or piston or things like that. Exactly. So yeah. just kind of wanted to hit this because, you know, sometimes people just don't think it through. They work on it all the time and they never really think what's going on and everything. Well, it's a good piece. It's not only, it's not only a good piece for, for the new guys coming mm -hmm. in, but it's, you know, Yep. For this to work, it needs to see this quite frequently. Yep. So, but you mentioned a good term. Which one? Floodback. Floodback. Floodback, as everybody knows in the industry, compressors do not pump liquid. At they least not for very long. Vapor. <laughs> they're designed. <coughs> they're designed to pump vapor. Yes, they are. If they start pumping liquid, they have a tendency to break. Uh huh. That's because you can't compress a liquid, but now even if you just get droplets of, of liquid coming back, it can wash the lubrication out of your bearings. That's oil. Yep. Because that, <laughs> that nice droplet of refrigerant 
just turn around and hit that warm bearing, it flashed off and refrigerant's a great solvent. It's a great degreaser. Yes. And it turns around and now you don't have oil lubricating that bearing surface and you tear up the bearings. So flood back, the definition of flood back is liquid refrigerant entering the compressor, which it should not do. Good one, Mikey. Un unless you're using liquid, liquid uh, cooling. <laughs> <laughs> unless it's a liquid pump. So anyway, so I just kind of wanted to cover this here. Now I have had people in Canada where they have trouble getting some of the parts in a timely manner. And so we had one young man that went over to a piston because it was a three week lead time on getting the expansion valve. Oh, well we're mechanics. I mean, yeah. we are gonna do mechanics, technicians, sorry, interchangeable there, <laughs> old guy. Uh, but we do what we gotta do right. to get the client right. up and running. And he told the client, this is not gonna be as efficient as it was, but as soon as that part comes in, I'm gonna come change it yep. and everything else. Here's another thing too. If you slightly overcharge something with an active metering device, it's a lot more forgiving because you'll just stack the refrigerant in the liquid line. Stack the refrigerant. There we go. Subcool. Subcool is the temperature at which the refrigerant dropped below the saturation temperature of, why don't you go more into the saturation? <laughs> Unless you want me to. <laughs> So stacking the condenser means at 10 degrees, at 10 degrees of subcool, you had one pipe full of liquid. If we went to 12 degrees, we had two pipes of liquid, which means we're stacking the condenser. Um, I love your explanation. Easier for the guys to understand. When you are looking at a condenser coil, the discharge pipe of the compressor goes into the top of that coil as it cools down at the bottom is the liquid. So when we say stacking, it's literally stacking tubes. That makes it easier for you to understand that. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I wanna hit the term saturation because yes. I think it's very, very important. Saturation by definition is that in your refrigerant, you have at least one molecule of liquid or one molecule of vapor. Because once you become 100% liquid, any heat we remove out of that liquid is now subcooling that liquid refrigerant. On superheat, once we go 100% vapor, all the heat that is continually added on the way back to the compressor is superheat. So it's heating the vapor after the change of state has taken place. And what's really cool is you can do a lot of fun things with saturation. Because <laughs> yeah. you can look at a PT chart and know what that saturated refrigerant pressure temperature relationship is yeah so all right so now it's your turn to throw your questions out we got some cool go back and find them you gotta go back and find them uh -oh, yeah there's, there's a lot, lot. <laughs> here's a flooding question how do you know if it's flooding back <sighs> compressor will scream at you for one well yeah first of all you're gonna hear the compressor is gonna get angry <laughs> Uh, but, <laughs> you need a temperature clamp and a pressure gauge. Put your temperature clamp on the suction line. You need to be six to eight inches away from the compressor. Why? You take, you, so you don't pick up heat from actually from the compressor itself. Yeah. <laughs> good question. No, good answer. <laughs> So you put your temperature clamp on, you have your pressure gauge on. You take the pressure that you read on the gauge, convert that to the saturation temperature that you read on the chart. Take the physical temperature from the clamp on the pipe, subtract the converted temperature from the actual temperature and that will tell you what your superheat is. If your superheat is zero or a negative number, you're flooding back. I see, Brian. In some oh. cases, it's one. God, point. he did a lot of work there. I'm going to give you guys a little secret. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. In the Blue On app, there's a subcooling and superheat calculator that now has all the standard refrigerants today. 
Exactly correct. So <laughs> make your life easy and go use the blue one app and use the subcool super heat calculator by putting your clamp on the pipe. Yep. And putting in the uh, if you put in the refrigerant and the pressure and the actual temperature, it will calculate it for you. You don't have to do math. Because remember, a long time ago, in one of these buckle ups, I told you when I got in the train, they told me there would be no math, and we're getting a hell of a lot closer, brother. We are. Because they lied. This train has a lot of math in it. <laughs> so, good answer. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Got a kudos from the Mikey. <laughs> Next one, how do you know the amount refrigerant in a system if it has a liquid line receiver? <coughs> there are a couple ways you can do that. <laughs> yeah. but it's there's a, like, there's a boatload. There's a, <laughs> again, that gets into a whole lot of math. You gotta know the size of the pipe, whether it's vapor or liquid, and you can do all the calculations off a of linear feed. You can also, pump it all into that receiver, valve it off, and, and take a liquid level measurement, find out what the volume is. There's a lot of ways you can do that. You can get a lot of recovery cylinders and remove all of the refrigerant and actually weigh it. Um, you can let, the, yeah, you can let the system start when it's hot, so the valves drive, drive wide open, and if you don't have enough refrigerant to feed the valves, you're not going to have anything in the way of subcooling, so and the receiver will be empty. Yep. But to calculate how much total how much total refrigerant you have in a system, you, you're really going to either have to do math. There's more work to it. You can't just walk up and do it. Or we just call Jed. <laughs> we, yeah, we call Jed. The other way of, the other way of doing it that it's still a wag. It's still a wild ass guess. Is somebody designed that system that's got a receiver in it? That receiver is designed to hold 100% of the refrigerant at 80% of the cylinder. So if you know what the size of the cylinder capacity is 100%, take 20% away from that and that should be your refrigerant capacity in the system. Good answer. That was a lot to there say. Was a lot there. If you had a 100 pound cylinder, and did that 20% math, that means that that system would have 80 pounds of refrigerant in it. I missed the first part, came back and wouldn't be Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I missed my Pepsi. <laughs> Water don't cut it for me, man. <laughs> Is superheat and subcooling the same in the winter on a heat pump? Sort of. Yeah, the, the, the big difference is, is that in the winter, you're gonna be working off of the outdoor metering device because you're absorbing the heat in the outdoor coil and you're having free flow through the indoor coil so you're bypassing the metering device on the indoor coil. You're bypassing the metering device, yes, because your liquid line is still your liquid line, but your suction line is no longer your suction line, it's the discharge line. If you wanted to calculate superheat and subcool, you have to know the, the head pressure and the liquid temperature, and you also have to be on the suction side of the reversing valve, as well as having your gauge on the true suction line on the unit. Cool. So you can still do the math. I would not look at a chart and go, these are my cooling manufacturer recommends uh, 12 degrees of superheat and 10 degrees of subcool when running and cooling. Those are not your superheat and subcool numbers for heating, no. But yes, basically you read it the same. Mm -hmm. How do you know the pressure is good in heat mode on a heat pump? <laughs> Charge it in the cooling mode. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've heard a lot of rule of thumb um, to know whether or not your charge is correct on a heat pump on 410A and I don't know 
whether it works on all the other refrigerants. I do know that on 410A, the rule of thumb is 30 degrees above ambient discharge line. If the discharge line is 30 degrees above what it is outside, then your charge is pretty damn daggone close. Daggone close. <laughs> Justin, wow, kind of like, you got the egg on close. I did. <laughs> Justin said, first time here, and this is amazing. All the knowledge. Thanks, Justin. Welcome, Justin. Yeah, Tell your friends. Thanks for being here, we bro. Go, we go live every other Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific, and these guys cover all kinds of different topics. So. And Justin, it's if awesome. you didn't know this, we go every other week. <laughs> she just told you that part. That's not the part. <laughs> what? <laughs> If you didn't know this, we have an app out. So you can go to either one of the stores. It's a totally free app. And, and you can download it. And it's got tips, tricks, manuals, equipment. Calculators. Form, calculators. The tech tools support. that we're talking about. And when all else fails, a there's a big, big red button. button. You, got, you get to talk to these two guys. <laughs> Call them and they'll help you out in that less than two minutes. The big red button is tech support. We're SOS. available 24-7, freaking 365. Yeah, let, me, let me put a qualifier in there. I, I, I'm not picking on young guys, but it's, it's those with less experience. It doesn't matter what your question is. We are here to help. So... If you think it's a stupid question, don't. Give us a call. I like nothing more than talking to the young guys and helping them. So don't hesitate to call us if you need something. I just keep hoping that by me giving back, my hair will revert to dark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm helping. Hi. Oops. Yeah, I got it. We can make that happen. <laughs> Just for men. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said you guys are great. Yes, they are. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, looking for other questions. <laughs> we don't have any fun doing this either. <laughs> Dude, I can't, we, I can't even believe you said how long you've been in the damn trade. I lie all the time. It's <laughs> been too long. You know, it's hear... been fun though. I, was, I, I remember. I remember. Well, while, while we're waiting for another question, these guys are gonna love this. I remember the first train in Telepack that I ever worked on. My journeyman. We climb up on this roof. He opens up the double door panel on the end because now they put them on the side back then they were on the end he opens up the double door panel and all i'm looking at is two walls of essex relays and black wire and he looks at me and goes i'm gonna go get us a couple of burgers when i get back you tell me what's wrong with it <laughs> uh i say that because i stuck in my mind forever and the second part of it that stuck in my mind forever is always start troubleshooting at the same point. When he got back, he was going, I got the burgers, what's wrong with it? And I'm still reading the voltage on all these stupid relays. And he goes, what's the transformer doing? Walk over, read, no voltage coming out of the transformer. He pulls a fuse, unscrews it, screws it back in. The machine starts, we close the door, we go down and have a burger. <laughs> <laughs> the point of his, the moral of the story, doesn't matter what the size of the machine is, it's got the four basic components, no matter what, and always start your troubleshooting in the same spot. Make sure you've got main voltage, make sure you've got control voltage, make sure your fuses aren't blown, and you just walk through it from there. It doesn't matter whether it's got one compressor or 15 compressors, it doesn't matter whether that compressor is a one ton or a 5,000 ton. It's got four basic components. Let me throw one other thing in there. <clears throat> if you go up on a roof and you've got a cooling problem, you're not going to look at any of the heating stuff. So you can already automatically get rid of that stuff. You know that's not where you've got to look. 
So you start looking on the things that are for your compressor, or do I have fan? If I've got fan, chances are I've got my, my transformer and everything. Good chance that yep. you've got control voltage if yep. the indoor blower is running. Yep, so now I can turn around <laughs> and it's like, okay, the low pressure switch might be keeping the compressor out, the high pressure switch, a thermal overload. <clears throat> but look at what the system's doing because you can eliminate some of those steps. Yep. But if you don't know what's going on, you've got to start with your basics because I don't care how big it gets, everything is based on your basics. You just adding more components, more controls, and it just grows. Yeah, it's like, going to, it's like going to a car dealership. You can get a car with manual windows, it's still got windows. Mm -hmm. But you can get an upgrade, and you can get that electric window. <laughs> Brian, I don't think a lot of these guys have ever seen cars with crank windows. No, these guys have never seen cars without air conditioning. <laughs> My first five work trucks had no air conditioning. Well, you didn't have the one that you just roll the windows down and the faster you go, the more air you get? Well, I, <laughs> I was behind Barney when you handed down the stone mobile. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> some guys will get that and <clears throat> some guys won't. I guess that's true. <laughs> and if you don't, call Jess. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> We got any more questions? Throw and we're back. Okay. Um, how do you know thermal overload is open on a compressor? Compressor won't run. That's good. That's the first indicator. Second indicator is you can fry an egg on it. Third indicator is actually take your own meter out and own the windings. If the compressor is cold to the touch or cool, meaning that you can put your hand on it for more than five seconds. That's cool to the touch. <laughs> now you own the windings. If the windings are still OL, then chances are you need to change the compressor. If you touch it and you can't, I mean, you're touching that compressor and you can't touch that compressor for more than three seconds, that compressor is extremely hot. You can ohm out the winding and it's probably open on uh, the overload's probably open. Yep. You can they make tools now that you can put on a garden hose that magnets to the top of the compressor, and instead of flooding the person's backyard, it just trickles some water out on those That's compressors cool. and it helps cool them down. Uh, <laughs> There's some great comments right now. <laughs> First off, no, I will never go in front of the camera. Wait a I minute. will forever <laughs> be <laughs> elusive. <laughs> I'm just the director. I don't know anything about HVAC. I only know the TXV joke that I've made a few times that everyone thought was Wait funny. What are the four basic components? They're right there. Condenser, compressor, evaporator, and metering device. See? See? That's, that's, the, she old, that's that another thing. The drawing. I did, but yes, that's it. So that's just, now, that, now the gauntlet has been thrown. You are going to do rookie mistakes with Jess. Okay. We're gonna throw, we're gonna do that. <laughs> I like that. Should we do that? I like that. Leave a, leave a suggestion in the chat uh, what the topic should be considering I just do marketing. But I'm open to suggestions. Um, someone said, I heard you guys navigated with paper maps like pirates. <laughs> we were that high tech. Thomas That's Brothers map. We had a Thomas guide. Yep. Thomas guide. Someone yeah, said one for Orange yeah. County, one for Riverside County, one San for Diego, LA County. LA, Orange, Someone Diego, said you Riverside. guys are fun to watch and listen to. That's good. All Someone right. asked, did Mike wear Tune sandals in. in the field? I'm sorry. I was, um, I was I was talking. I missed hit the question. I love to pick on Mike. <laughs> he says, did I actually wear sandals in the field? <clears throat> yes, he didn't wear shoes in the field. Technically, I was very professional and wore boots in the field. <coughs> and on September the 30th, thanks to that person reminding me, I'm going to get into the trunk of the car, my show car. I have a show car. And I'm going to get into the trunk, and I will bring the Thomas Brothers map and show all you kids what you used to have to do before GPS. <laughs> well, you know, we could go way back. Remember when they had those stupid beepers and you had to get off the freeway? 
and call the dispatcher to and tell I will you. bring in my <laughs> Motorola phone, my pager, and all that stuff that is just clogging up a stupid spot in a drawer. It was so amazing when they got one that had numbers on top. I Remember know. that? That and was you happening. Could, and you could actually answer back. Well, that was later on. But anyway. <laughs> I wish I had my first cell phone. The brick. Oh, I had one before that. And for those of you that want to see what the brick looks like, um, um, the movie with uh, uh, Glover and yeah. uh, uh, Lethal Weapon. Yep. Look at Lethal Weapon 1, when Danny Glover is standing on the bridge, he is talking on a phone that I actually had. <laughs> but you know, one, one thing that has, has gone kind of like in reverse, my first cell phone bill for the first month yeah. was $1,100. <laughs> what? <laughs> you paid by the minute. You sure and it did. wasn't cheap. No. <laughs> Talk about trickle down. Yeah. It sucks. <laughs> Invoicing went up. <laughs> <laughs> um, got a few more questions. This, okay. is, this is a cool comment. Just oh. joined Blue on today. You are all amazing. Can't wait to use it in the field. Welcome Woo! on board. Welcome aboard, brother. Welcome to the PD. Poor sister. She didn't say what we, your name was. We so. hit 65,000 people on our app today, which is wild. So thank you guys for all the support you always give us. You really appreciate it. And what we do is completely free. So we're just here to help you guys out. So Cheers tell tell your friends. Tell your friends. Download the app. Only helps you out. And just do we actually have a closer date when Studio B will be here? Uh, I would say two to three months out. Two to three more months. This is going to be great. We, we're making a studio. He needs to do. You need to get off your trickle-down effect. Yes. <laughs> we're making a studio, a podcast studio, out of a shipping container that's actually going to be right here. Um, so it's going to be super awesome, all soundproof, and whiteboards. Gonna be air and it's going to be air-conditioned. <laughs> it is going to be air-conditioned. Providing we do the calculations. <laughs> we're going to put a mini split or two in there, which is pretty cool. Sweet. So. Or three, or or maybe a VRF. <laughs> That's true. We're going we're gonna to put something in there so that uh, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You guys have seen, we sit in front of the test chamber. So in order for us to do this, we have them shut the test chamber down. When mm -hmm. they shut the test chamber down, all that heat stays in here. Really hot. <laughs> so, and the know, lights. We're in December. Yeah. We're behind the lights. Uh, and we'll be sweating because it just gets extremely hot in here. So we're excited about Studio yep. B. Plus, and we're going to be able to do more trainings and things like that. Whiteboards. And, so, and yeah, yep. it's, it's going to be awesome. Oh, MG, it's going to be so cool to be, awesome. be able to uh, do the video trainings and, and post those as well. And, yep. That'll be a library you guys can look at, and we're yeah. pumped. We're pumped. The other thing, if there are some topics that you guys really want to get into, let us know. Because Brian and I sit there, just, we, Jess sends us an email and says, what's our topic going to be? <laughs> and we try to grab something that we, you know, off the tech support calls for the week and everything else to try to come up with something that's going to be beneficial to you guys. But if there's stuff you want, let us know. DM us on here, and I'll, I'll see it. Yep. Blue on Brian, blue on community, at, at. At blue on community. At blue on community, at blue, blue on, on Brian. Brian. See, it don't trust me with that kind of communication. Well, <laughs> it's got something to do with the tookus, and I'm not exactly sure what okay. they meant by that. All right, we'll have to explain that at a later date. All right, you got any more questions? I think we'll start to wrap up here if you have any last minute questions. Uh, before we go, Reminding everyone that the Blue On Forum is now live in the Blue On app. So this app is still completely free, just another tab at the bottom. So go into the App Store, hit Update if you haven't already, update your Blue On app, and you'll have access to this first amazing HVAC forum where you can ask questions, answer other people's questions. There's no censorship, no BS, nothing like that at all. So it's super easy to find information, super fast, easily tagged posts, everything like that. So we've been working on this for years now. So we're super excited. It's live. Again, it's totally free. And it doesn't stop. We continue to add. We continue yep. Every day grow. there's new posts in there. Just text helping text out. It's really, really cool. So be sure to check it out. Tell your friends. Again, totally free. Manuals um, and equipment. We're almost, we're almost at 50,000 pieces of equipment in there. 
Almost. And reminder, if you are working on a piece of equipment that you can't find in the app, just call up tech support and they will get what you need easily, even if it's not in the app. So yep. a little reminder. Pick me, pick me. <laughs> <laughs> call that big red button and it will help you out. So yeah. All right. Any last comments from you two? Guys. I know we're coming out of summer. It was a great summer. We all stayed busy. You guys all stayed healthy. Now we're going into winter, but don't forget, stay safe, stay healthy. Don't get lax on your safety stuff. Use the tools that are there. Uh, we wanna make sure that everybody's here through all of these holidays that are coming up. Yeah. And for those of you that uh, have to live and drive in the snow and the ice, and constant rain you know be careful be safe slow down um it, it's it's worth getting to the job as well more importantly getting yourself back home to be with your family yeah love you guys thank you very peace, much y'all peace out y'all have a see great, you in two thursdays see you on september 30th Ooh. Sweet. peace, peace.